Is it all here for today? Okay. Somebody raising their hands back there? Okay. Just waving. Okay. All right. Any visitor among us today that is a visitor? Any visitor? Shy? All right. I can see some hands. Not sure whether here or there. Okay. All right. We'll leave them. Maybe they're shy. So we just praise God for every one of us that is here today. As we can see, the church appears a little bit scanty. A lot of people, maybe they are out celebrating for this weekend. They've traveled and a lot of other programs are going on. But those of us in the sanctuary, we know that the Lord is here to bless us and to tabernacle with us. And also, we are really blessed with a special speaker for this um, Sabbath. At the right time, she'll be introduced to us. And we know we shall surely be blessed in that respect. So at this time, we're going to sing the Winter Garden Church song for us to welcome everybody to the sanctuary. Good morning, church family. We are about to begin our praise and worship. And the first song we are going to do is number 336. There is a fountain. We will be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. 1, 2, 3, and 6.
6. There is a no blur, sweet song. I'll sing thy part to say. When this morning's thin stabbing tongue is ransomed from the grave, is ransomed from the grave, is ransomed from the grave. Majesty, worship his majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be a glory. Let us all stand for the opening song, He Lives, 251. Yeah. And 
just the time I need Him. He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and He talks with me. Along as narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he Sabbath Church. Today's scripture will be taken from Esther 4, verse 14. It reads as follows. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews for, from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows your, whether you may come to the kingdom for such time as this. Amen.
this moment let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in time to pray. Let us find ourselves in the mode of prayer. Whether you are going to be kneeling, that is, uh, would be a, a better way to do it. Or let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us kneel. Father in heaven, we are grateful today that we serve a risen Savior and he's in the world today and we can feel him because he's living in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for that provision because our lives would be so empty. We would be so wanting, but because of Jesus Christ living in us, we know we serve a risen Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that we as unworthy children, through Jesus, can come before you to petition the throne of grace, to sue for mercy, and to sing your praise. We say hallelujah praise to Jesus today because we know we can come to you and you will hear and you will answer us as we come with our faces differ so are different needs lord we lay them all before you today we know you can take care of them sometimes we only can come to you with a groan in our hearts because we do not even know how to express ourselves but this morning lord we come knowing that the Holy Spirit who you have given us to be here to comfort us and to bless us and to take our prayers to you in groaning is here in this midst. Lord, bless each individual one of us that are here and we pray, Father, that you will abide with us. You'll never leave us because you promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us. Father, we come with our requests for some have financial situation some job situation some are in need of care from loved ones to hear from them some have different needs even the aching bones today who are here the ones that are aching walking lord with a cane walking with a sick back walking nevertheless but we all come into your course to praise you and we thank you lord because you invited us to come remember those who are, have traveled to graduations to other places lord as they are experiencing their loved ones their children being graduated lord we celebrate with them today and pray lord that you will continue to bless them we think about elder and sister campbell who are there with high and today has she graduated this young woman who have excelled so well lord we thank you for her life and we pray lord that you will continue to help her to be in service for you bless all good college and all the other colleges lord that celebrate you and celebrate their their children today we thank you and we say amen lord we pray that thou will be near us as you bring a word to us to our speaker lord bless her and may she continue to lift you up and may your name be glorified bless us today and what we fail of asking thee lord you know it from every heart that is here before you those who are online and those who will be listening we pray that you will hear us and bless us to this end we pray for christ's sake amen oh,
this is a time you get your special music. And it is wonderful when we can use our own. And today we are going to hear from our own caller, Brian. So at this time, we'll sit back and listen as the caller gives us our special music. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I want, Lord, to 
draw me nearer to your bleeding Johnson, you have Paula in your hands now. But I will call Paula in the night at her job. You're singing tomorrow during the COVID online. And she always say, well, I got to do that. I said, no, God will give you the words. And she will call me back and say, yes. Paula could sing. Amen. Paula could sing. Amen. But I know that where that come from. They said it chipped on off of the block. Sister Reed. You have indeed done a good job with the children. The time of worship, this part of worship is very important. I may not shout at, at our pastor, Pastor Lee. But I'm here to assist of letting us know myself. If you check your bulletin in the back and the treasure is here, if you check your treasure in the back, right below there, it says January 2024 to March 16, church budget, receive year to date, 34% under the budget. Tithes and offering, tithes year to date, 17% under the budget, same as 2023. Why I'm saying this, I'm talking to myself. Tithes and offering belongs to God. That comes from his word. I am not going to tell you to hold your tithes and offering for put in the church, local church, that we have to pay bills. My brothers and sisters, when you see those lights, you see the bright lights in the back there? Woo hoo hoo. We come in over here too. But to tell you, I'm not going to call the figure because we have a department now is going to handle fundraising. But I'm just extending an understanding when I was at the finance meeting, I was hurting to see the money spending in this church. Carefully, I just want to use my word carefully. We need to have our building. The conference is not going to pay and we know we got a conference leader in the house. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too hard on the conference. The conference is looking after the out of work and to pay our pastors and get them the shepherd. But I'm crying out today. When I listen to the finance board and sit on that board, Pastor, read online with us, we have to do better. Brother Dukram, you have to do better. We have some departments are exploring, our music departments and all the departments exploring. You see the blessing, but the blessing has to come from you also in giving. I don't want to go farther. You have a home. You know the taxes double up now. Your insurance for the house doubling up. <laughs> it hurting. So let us keep this beautiful sanctuary that God blessed us with by giving more to Winter Garden Church locally so we can have a benefit of the blessing what we're receiving every Sabbath. Amen? I'm not going to extend it more for, but to just let you know, brothers and sisters, I have a reading for me and you today before I prayed. Our new system we're going to be doing, taking up our offering, you will see today, we're going to follow this pattern throughout till the pastor and the team decide to change this pattern of our picking up our tithes and offering. Listen to what God said. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The encouragement, God love a cheerful giver. If we give, he will give. You know, we cannot give God. But this I say, 
He which soweth sparingly, soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. And he which sow bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according, according as he pour, pursueth in his heart. In his heart. Now God knows our heart. All right? So let him give not grudgingly or necessity for God love a cheerful giver. That is for me. And I spoke with my wife. We have to do something more for Winter Garden Church. May God bless us all. Take it in. Do for Jesus. Do for Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your son, your child, your servant, the words which was used here on your pulpit. I pray God for the receiving heart, the hearing online in the church to know better with the understanding to give to you. Lord, we can never outgive you. Lord, one time when I came into the church, I pay my bills and do things before I give you what belongs to you. But Lord, I thank you for the conviction. It's reversed. And I thank you, God, for the conviction. Whatever I gain, tent belongs to you first and a love token. Help us all to understand that this is from your word. And I pray, God, even through this breath of life that you lend to me and us in here is a lending process. All the material stuff is lending process. But let us give to honor you, to bless you, and to bring others to the kingdom of God. May God bless each one of us in Jesus' name in giving. You can turn.
So our children's sermon now. And uh, our children. Oh, oh. So we have to ask some adult children. Yeah, we have a few in the back. Short children offering will be given out. We have some in the back. Please come up. I was doing, whoops, mm, I was doing this. I was categorizing people. I put them into the widow's mite and from the widow's mite to up there and in between. I'm going to tell you guys, don't do this. Because what I discovered from doing this fundraising is that the widow's mite are the ones who are doing the sacrifice because they see things a little different from the one that I put up there. You see, they know that what they contribute is for the kids. They could have been out there in a gang doing something else, but they are part of a club, something that's going to benefit them now and even in the future. The ones that we put up there what they see is their money depleting from what they've got. And some of them would even tell you that they don't even have enough to give you a book of stamp. And they are the ones that don't give you as much as you were expecting. So don't do like me. Because one widow's mite that I knew of, and I knew everything about that person, I was 85.5% off. And the other one that I did a little bit over there, I was 50% off. So don't say, oh, I know they can't. Don't do that. Because they are the ones who will help your kids. Trust me. Believe me. 
Now, I'm, I'm asking you this. I'm going to get to your story. I'm asking you this. We have some paper bags with some envelopes. We had three prayer team people prayed over those, and they changed it from letters to blessings. And when they prayed, they said, touch it, first blessing. Read it, second blessing. Respond to it. That's when Jesus answers your prayer and said, I'll pour you out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. And if none of you have had this experience, then check yourself because I could give you testimony on how God, you don't know where it's coming from and you have no reason why, but God will open a door for you. Now, all I'm asking you guys to do, those who will say, well, I did already, we, ha we still have a few more letters or blessings. Just take one. You have one family member or one friend or one coworker, just one, and send that out and see where it goes because that one person can be the one that will spread it for you. And uh, I have to throw this one in because, you see, when I'm done with the Pathfinders, I will be back here again, but this time it will be music. So I'm preparing you all for that. So you're going to see me up here trying to recruit for the music. But please, oh, what other things? Scamming. I had no idea how bad it is, so in case you all didn't know. Some people thought it was a scam. And even though I text them in WhatsApp, my friend told me that they are so slick that that doesn't even work. So the advice she gave me, I'm giving to you guys, give the person that you send the letter to or the blessings a call, short call. I'm only calling to let you know that what you receive is coming from my church so they know it's legit. Thank you all. Okay, now let's get to you guys. And this is for all of you. Boys and girls, when I was growing up, they had story time, which I loved because we were not allowed to go to movies. So we would pray, somebody would tell us some stories and then our imagination would run with it. So it's like us watching TV. Now it's free. Everybody watch TV. Well, there was a story I heard when I was a kid. And I wanted to share this with you because um, now children need to know this. And grown-ups need to learn a lesson from this too. My story today is entitled... It went out of my head. <laughs> But it will come back. How many of you ever seen rats? How many of you would love that when you step out your door, all you see is just rats all over your grass, all over your yard? Would you like that? Thank you. Pied Piper. Okay. Well, um, they had these villages. And for little ones who don't know what a village is, it's just like... I'm living in an area called Mineola, and right next to it, it has Claremont, and then you have Groveland. Okay, well, it's all that those little vigilers together. Well, each one would have a leader. Now, they start seeing rats coming into their little village. And when rats have babies, they got a lot of babies. And they start seeing everywhere rats, rats, rats. They lock up their house because they don't want them to come inside the house. But even the children had to stay indoors because it got so bad. Now, this is a little twist to the story. Well, one day, a stranger came into the village, was a little tired, he sat on a stump. But there were the village people and they went after the leader. We cannot take this anymore. You've got to get rid of these rats. If you don't, we are just going to have to leave this village and go someplace else. Now, there's something I want you to remember. There are some people that they like to be in charge. And if they get that position of being the leader, they don't want to lose that. So do you think they want all these people to leave the village when they cannot go to that other village and become the leader? No. So he was panicking what to do, what to do. So this stranger sitting on the stump kind of overheard the conversation and watching, and then he's looking, rats here, rats there, rats there. So he went and he knocked on the door. And the leader said, I told you I'll take care of it. Just give me a chance. So he kept on knocking. So he opened the door, but then it wasn't the people of the village, it was a stranger. 
What are you doing here? What can I do for you? Oh, I'm here to help you. Help me. If you can't get rid of this rats, get away from my door. That's what I'm here to help you with. You know how to get rid of those rats. Oh, come on in. Come on in. So he said to him, I will get rid of these rats. However, you need to pay me $100 when I do. $100? Oh, sure. As long as you get rid of these rats, I will pay you that $100 said, okay, fine. Then he walked out. He went and sat on the stump. He said, I thought you were getting rid of the rats. He said, patience, patience. Oh, you're one of those. Lagged the man off and he was going back to his room. Then he turned and he looked and he saw him take out this bag and he took out a flute. Now he thought the man was really kidding. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of a rat. I better lock this room before another person come inside here and start nagging me about these rats. Then he closed his door and the man started playing his little flute. You know what a flute is? No, never seen it? This long little thing and they put their fingers on it and the little fingers are going up and down these holes. Okay, one day I'll show you something like it. Okay, well, turns out while he was playing, the rats kind of heard that music, so they started coming around him. And when he looked and he saw them coming, but there was somebody inside the house and they're peeking out on him. What's going on out there? Then he got up and he started to walk. And what do you know? Those rats were following behind him. Well, there was somebody there saying, mm, we got to follow and find out what's going on. And he just kept on playing and he walked out. And when he got through the gate, all these rats, no matter where they were, any corner, everyone was right out behind the man. And he made a left turn. And the person behind, peeking and watching and trying to figure out, oh, that's down to the sea. Where in the world is he going? And they went behind, and the rats not caring about him. They're just interested in the music. And he kept on playing, and he kept on playing. And then he got to the water. People were like, what's going to happen? He kept on playing and he stepped in the water and he kept on playing and he walked and he kept on. And the rats kept following him all the way in the water. And then he just turned this way to make sure he's still in the water until when he realized that, okay, all these rats are now in the water. People are going, oh no. What do you think happened to the rats when they went into the water? Yes. Down. He came out of the water. And he went now to the village leader and he said, I did what I told you to do. Now, if you give me, he's all wet. If you give him my hundred dollars, I'll be on my way. He said, oh no, I am not giving you that hundred dollars until I see for myself. Are they going to come out in the night? I'm looking outside. He said, look outside. Well, see me tomorrow. So he did. He sat out there on the stump, got himself all nice and dry again. And in the morning, he went back. And that same person that was sneaking around, they were all so looking. And he said, okay, just give me my $100 and I'll be on my way. He said, how am I so sure that you won't bring those rats back? So one of the persons who felt said, oh, they won't come back. We saw, we were behind. They ran over and they were all in the water. Oh, good. So everybody came out and they were excited. They said, okay, it's time for celebration. Yeah, we're going to celebrate. And the kids came out and they said, can we play outside? They said, sure, go on outside. There's no rats. You can all have a good time out there. And they said, okay, we are going to have us a grand time. So we're going to all go inside, clean up and cook and have a big old party. So the man said, okay, now could you give me my hundred? The village leader said, did you hear it said they're just going to have a party? I can't give you any money. We're going to spend our money and have a party. So he said, you promised to give me $100 if I got rid of the rats. He said, well, too bad now. You can, on your way, be gone. So he said, when you make promises and you break it, there's always a consequence. I'm giving you the last chance. Let me have my $100. He said, and I'm giving you the last word. Be gone. 
out of my village. You go. So he went and he sat on the stump. And he sat on the stump. And the children were out playing. The parents were inside cleaning up. They were all cooking. And the kids were having a grand time. He took that flute out again. And he started playing. And while he was playing, the children now said, Ooh, nice music. So they started having their own party. They started to dance around him. And when he got all those children coming around him, he got up. He walked out just like he did with the rats. But this time he didn't turn left towards the water. He turned right. And the kids were behind him, and they were dancing, and they were dancing, and they are gone. So now everybody come out with all their goodies, and they say, it's a bit quiet out here, isn't it? And the kids say, you bet they must be playing hide and seek or something, he said. But when they call, Caleb, no answer. Mary, no answer. And then it dawned on them. Their kids were not there. So they said, come on now, we're not joking, we're not playing. If you're playing games, come on out. Nobody was coming out. Then that guy who followed the rat says, ooh, I think I know what happened. He played his instrument and he got all the rats out. He played and the kids were dancing out here, so maybe they went with him. So some of them run down towards the water and there was no sign, and people were there, and they said, no, nobody came this side. They went to the other villages, and they can't find their kids. They just disappear like that. And now, they also found out from the man that the leader promised to pay, and he refused to pay, and there was a consequence. Now, it's not just for him. But all the children are gone. See, something I learned from that story, boys and girls. Number one, don't make promises that you know you're not going to keep. And number two, nowadays they tell children, in my days they didn't tell you that, you don't follow strangers. So for the children, you learn that lesson. And for the grown-ups, don't be cheap. You promise to pay, pay. If you don't, there's a consequence. And the truth is, if you do pay, there's a good consequence. That's when God will pour out and bless you. So, keep that story in mind. Okay, boys and girls? And to all of you. All right. You want to pray? You going to come and pray for me? No? You don't want to pray. Caleb, you want to come and pray for me? Come on. Let's close our eyes for prayer. We go in heaven. We thank you that you kept us safe and you see who led us to church and let us have a good time. And Jesus, my prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen, 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 amen. We just want to thank our sister, Sister Brian, for the children's story. And um, at this time, we're going to introduce our speaker for today. And um, twice I've been privileged to listen to our sister, Sister Madrid. I think the first time was at um, Gilgal Church when we are having the program, funeral program for our dear brother, brother Kirsten's wife. And um, I was like, praise God. The Lord is good. You know, when you listen to the word and the word is coming from the scriptures and you can see the depth of the message. And then the second time was when we are doing the, the last seven words or so of Christ. And we went by Mount Sinai and our pastor too was there. And our sister came up and he broke the word of life. 
And I know that it was God that was speaking through her. And I know definitely this Sabbath, we're not going to be disappointed because the same God is still alive. Amen. And the same God is going to use her mightily. Amen. I was telling Sister um, Leah, Sister Leah in the media room there, I said, when she said she's going to the congregation, I said, well, you'll be blessed. And definitely our prayers are going to be with our sister. And I'm just going to go through the biography that was given to me. And it says, Alexis Madrid is a city girl from Brooklyn. And when I read that, the first thing that came to my mind, because many years ago when I was in Brooklyn, I entered in the middle of the night and I saw a lot of the young girls and young boys, they were hanging around the corner of the street. And the thought that came to my mind was, can anything good <laughs> come out of Brooklyn? You know, but I've been corrected several times. First of all, by Chaplin, I've forgotten his name now. He said, Pastor, I'm also from Brooklyn. And then when I listened to her sister and I was reading through the biography, and I saw their Brooklyn, city of Brooklyn, I said, God be praised. He said, Alexis Madrid is a city girl from Brooklyn, New York. I is now a proud citizen of Florida. Amen. Pastor Madrid is a graduate of the School of Prophets, Oakwood University, with a Bachelor of Science in Religion and Religion, Science in Religion. Pastor Madrid has served as campus minister for District 1 and North Florida as part of the Southeastern Conference campus ministries. She currently serves as associate pastor of the Mount Sinai Church in Orlando, Florida. A veteran of the United States Navy, she holds a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from North Central University with certifications in trauma intervention and suicide prevention. Pastor Madrid is happily married to Mr. Miguel Madrid and the mother of three boys. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, Alexis, affectionately known as Lex, has felt the calling on her life from a very young age and has always had the gift of teaching I'm preaching. Lex loves the Lord, and that is very evident in the way she interacts with others. She's also a powerful preaching woman and has the ability to convey the word of God in such a simple manner that young, old, male, or female may be able to understand. And I testify to that. She has served the Lord, the church, and different, uh, the church and different conferences in various capacities for over, I just have to take a look at her again, <laughs> for over 20 years. And she looks like 18. <laughs> and it went on to say, let me just make sure, Lex, the lover of life, and other favorite scriptures. Our favorite scripture is John chapter 10, verse 10. A thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I'm come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Amen. So let's pray for her. She will soon be coming up. But before she comes up, we're going to have the praise team of Winter Garden Church to bless us. Amen. Amen. Pastor Onatunde did say the praise team, but this is also your moment to sing with us and join with us and sing, You are my all in all. 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, Winter Garden. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This, this, I had a kind of a funny week. It was a, it was my son's birthday, 
And you know, he was, uh, yeah, I have my middle son. It was his birthday. But the problem with my son, he thinks that his birthday is the whole month. And so he said, Mama, you know, he has these, you know, these kids, they broke people always want the most things, right? And he said, uh, Mama, let's go get something to eat. And I was sad when he asked me to go to the restaurant because that means that I'd have to spend some money. And then after we went to the restaurant, me being sad because my pockets felt it, he said, Mama, he wanted to go to the arcade. And I don't know if you've ever been to the arcade. It's very, very loud and noisy. So he said, Mama, I said, he said, can we go to the arcade? And I was sad when he asked me to go to eat. Now I'm mad that he asked me to go to the arcade. But I woke up this morning, and, and I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The psalmist said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Winter Garden, it is good to be with you today. Uh, I want to thank your pastor, the shepherd of this flock, Pastor Chelston Lee. I just wonder how y'all still got a roof up here. You, that, I mean, this must be for what? Vibranium, that, that, that Wakanda uh, 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 material. Y'all still got a roof with uh, Pastor Chelston. I just want to set one thing straight. Uh, Winter Garden is not the best church in the conference. He told y'all that this morning. I just want to make this clear. Winter Garden and the sister church, which is sister church, uh, which is South Lake. He said the one and two churches is the second and third church with Mount Sinai. Being the number one, I just had to make that clear. <laughs> but it is a blessing to be here with you guys this Sabbath. I was here before um, in, I forget when, but I was here before. And it, it was, you know, once again, it feels like family in here. So I, I want you guys, we're having a conversation, right? We're just going to have a conversation because we cousins. Elder Dukram, thank you so much. And, 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 and Pastor uh, Onatunde? On a, okay, I didn't want to say it wrong. You know, I did my DNA and it says that I'm, you know, mostly African. So, <laughs> so uh, on this uh, um, um, women's, actually Mother's Day, how, how many mothers we have? We don't got no mothers here today? Y'all ain't? No? Oh. Okay, so uh, I, I know it's Mother's Day weekend, so men, you want to make sure that you make your, if you are mothers, make them the mothers in your life feel special today. I'm going to tell you a secret. Most mothers would like for you to hire the Pied Piper <laughs> in the story. And get the flute and get the kids at the house. You two go and stay gone. Don't bring me no breakfast in bed because I got to go wash the dishes when we out, get out the bed. Don't make me nothing. Don't just go away for the day. <laughs> so, but today I, 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 we're, we're going to look at... at uh, how women have been looked at throughout the world's history. And if we were to look down the annals of history, women and mothers have always been there. They were not as invisible as some of us, as some would have us think. In a man's world, women have always been there. From Eve to the wives of Noah and his sons, they have been there. Sarah was, Sarah was there beside our father Abraham, Rebecca, Ruth, Esther, and even the little maid in Naaman's courts. Uh, women have always been there. Mary
Mary, the mother of the Savior, Anna, who defied death until she witnessed the consolation of Israel. Women have always been there from Eden to Calvary. They were the last ones at the cross and the first ones at the tomb. They have always been there. They have been there supportively. They have been there faithfully. They have been there prayerfully. They have been there boldly and defiantly. They have been there courageously and valiantly. They have been there redemptively. Women have always been there. And so today I, for, give me about 25 minutes, I got to go back to my church. Oh yeah, I know I smelt that. I'm going to have to call my church and tell them I'm going to call my baby a little late. For 25 minutes, I want you to pray with me as we Study the word for such a time as this. Hover on me, Holy Spirit. Bathe my trembling heart and tongue. Fill me with thy hallowed presence, Lord. Come, O oh come, and fill me now, Lord. Lord, I am weakness, so much weakness. At thy sacred feet I bow. But, Lord, I need thee. I greatly need thee. Come, O oh come, and fill me now. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Esther. What did I say? You got to talk to me. Oh, I think the book of Esther. And we're looking at Esther 4. And we're reading from 13, actually 12. And it says, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. 13 reads, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do you think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom... For what? For such a time as this. And we know the story. We meet Esther in the courts of King Ahasuerus or King Xerxes. And we know what happened in the story. The, the king and his friends were partying and he, he wanted her to come out and entertain. He wanted his king, his queen, Queen Vashti to come out and entertain him and his friends. And I don't know if you've been around a bunch of drunk men with power. I know y'all been watching the, 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 the Diddy Chronicles and the Epstein Chronicles. What happened when you get a bunch of drunk men with power and I, he wanted his wife to come out and entertain them. And you can just use your imagination as to what that entertainment means because I know for, she wasn't no singer. And I imagine Vashti being, being, being uh, uh, from Flatbush <laughs> and telling the king he is, she's not interested in, in being the entertainment for him and his drunk friends. And, and plus, she's about to go get her hair done. Of course, the king is infuriated and he doesn't want to look weak in front of his friends. And so he asked his friends what he should do. And in chapter one of Esther, he said, his friends said to King Xerxes, you better check that woman. Because if you don't, women everywhere will think that they can talk back and be insubordinate. And, and we don't have time for a million women's march in Persia. You got to understand the culture. Women were powerless within that culture. Women were inferior, subordinate, dispensable, weak, considered unintelligent, and were used as currency. I'm hearing some of y'all sign because I know as I'm reading the story, I know some of y'all here and went to Garden Church would not last in Persia. I know some of y'all in the congregation would not have survived in Persia. 
Keisha? Keisha wouldn't survive in Persia? Can you imagine the, the, the king asking Keisha to get him and his friends some Kool-Aid? Or some sorrel? And Keisha is telling the king, you need to get it yourself. It's after your hand them broke. I don't think black and brown women would have survived that long in Persia. And as the story continues, the king decides to get rid of Vashti and he holds a contest for the new queen. And we see Esther here on the scene. And we know from scripture that Esther or Hadassah is raised by her uncle Mordecai and it was his idea for Esther to participate in this contest. And, and in chapter 2, uh, verses 12, it tell, in verse 17, tells us that the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other girls. And so he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen. The scripture continues in Esther 2 and verse 10, and it tells us that Esther was still listening to the instructions of her uncle. And he told her, don't reveal your family history. Don't reveal your background. And she listened to Mordecai. Can you imagine here in 2024 that you have just won a pageant and they're going to tell you don't tell anybody. I would have been on Facebook so fast. I would have been on Facebook and Instagram status. New queen of Persia. I wonder if sometimes in our society, if we talk too much, too soon. In this society, we no longer have secrets. We put everything in the open. I go on social media and everybody is telling their business. We have people. I know Wendy Williams made a fortune from just telling people's business. Nothing is sacred anymore. Everybody is telling their business. Not only are they telling their business, they're showing their business. Facebook this and Facebook that, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. And here's the phenomenon I don't understand. There's some people, you know, on social media, and they said, you know, for all the people that are watching me, mind your business. I'm only on here to mind your business. That's the whole point. I can't mind what you don't tell me. And the crazy part about it is you don't have to speculate or guess. You can go on and they tell you all their business. And I tell my young people this all the time. Everybody don't need to know all your business. Everybody don't need to know all your business. I see them, listen, I, and I work a lot with our young people, and they don't realize that whatever you put on social media stays on social media. Yeah, modesty is no longer prized. I see some of in our churches are sending and posting pictures, explicit pictures, and they're doing it for free. Y'all not understand. They, and I'm not saying you should, but at least get you a dinner or something to eat. Free of charge. And I said, don't you know that when you hit send, that's it? Our young men are wondering why they didn't get the call back from the Fortune 500 company. Well, they went to your Facebook profile and they saw what you like to smoke and drink in your spare time. They, said they saw how drunk you like to get when you party. And they decided that they no longer want you to represent their company. Sometimes it's okay to keep your business your business. 
Some of us need to be part of the hush ministries. Keep your business to yourself. And the Bible says because Esther listened to Mordecai, she did not reveal who she was or what her lineage was. You know, black folk, we quick to tell people what we mix with. Where you from? What you mix with? The Bible said that Mordecai was a man of God. And in, 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 in Esther 2 and 23, as the story uh, uh, unfolds, it tells us that Mordecai uncovered a plot to overthrow the king and the culprits were dealt with. Now here comes Haman on the scene. And some of you guys may know some Hamans in your life. Haman was a rich, pompous, arrogant man. He wanted to receive the same reverence as the king. You ever go to work and somebody want to tell you how to you do your job? And they want to ask you what time did you clock in and clock out? And they want to tell you what to do and what not to do? And they're not the supervisor? And they want to report to the supervisor and tell the supervisor, you're not the supervisor. And this is Haman. Haman wanted the same respect as the king. And so, of course, Haman wanted every, uh, everybody to bow to him. But Mordecai refused to bow because Mordecai said, I bow to God and God alone. And Haman defies the plot once again when people get mad. He devised a plot. And let me tell you how sin works. Haman is mad at Mordecai. Instead of just dealing with Mordecai, he devises a plot to decimate the whole population of the Hebrews. And I never like serial killers. Kill who you mad at. What that got to do with us? Haman is mad with Mordecai, but he decided that I am going to destroy the entire nation of Israel. Haman got the king on board and carry out to carry out his plan and the king agreed and he sealed it with his ring. You have to understand in those cultures when the king signed a decree and he signed it with his ring it was signed sealed and it was almost delivered and the children of God were asking where is God? I just want to tell you here that God has a purpose for your life. As we read in chapter 4, here comes Esther. Esther's queen now, and she's, she, 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 she's uh, experiencing a, a, a queen life. Esther has no idea what is going on. And after she, Mordecai visits Esther in 4, in, in 4, in 4, 1 says when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And so Esther, he goes and he tells Esther about the impending doom. And Esther seems to be the only hope. Now, you must understand the gravity of the matter. Come with me to chapter 4 and verse 11. Chapter 4 and verse 11, and it reads, Esther reads, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law to put all to death, except the one to him the king holds out the golden scepter. Yet I myself have not been called to go to the king in 30 days. Esther is now the queen. And it's been 30 days since she has seen her husband. Anybody here who ain't seen their husband in 30 days, wherever you was, you won't stay there. If you don't come home tonight, you stay where you at. Can you imagine 30 days your man don't come home? Well, I know some of us wish, please do me a favor and come home. 
30 days. And it may seem strange to us that a wife may not have access to her husband at any time or vice versa. You see, in Persia, they had rules and laws that governed women, even the queen. And even though the king was married, his role as king dominated his role as husband. Let me rephrase that to some of y'all that didn't give me an amen. Let me rephrase that. Marriage was secondary to the state position as king. It's sad to say that a lot of our marriages are like that today. Some of our husbands have, have neglect, neglected their wives and their families while they elevate their jobs and their careers to their number one priority. Some of our husbands spend long hours at the job and at business meeting. I don't hear nobody. You got business meeting and, and, and board meeting and, and finance committee meeting. I just stopped by here to tell you, you are not the good shepherd. Some of our men, husbands, we... They hide behind church work. So they have an opportunity not to be at home. But, but, but God said, upon this rock, I build my church. And that rock is Jesus. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are not the good shepherd. Jesus is. Your family should be your number one priority. Your first ministry is not the church. Your first ministry is your house. And we wives do the same thing. And I know it's difficult to hear and y'all may not invite me back here and I don't care. But we wives, we prioritize our children over our husbands. Yeah. Let me rephrase that. Ladies and wives and mothers, our husbands come first. Before God created a mother, he created a wife. Trust me, I'm a therapist. Children are happier and more secure when they know that mommy and daddy's relationship is stable. Our children do better when they know that mommy and daddy are good. Them kids are going to grow up and they are going to leave you. I have my oldest son is 15 years old. He already looking at them little raggedy girls down the street. Adam canceled so many date nights because he needed me. And he worried about the little rag girl on the street. We have to build our marriages stronger than we build our relationship with it. We have to build our marriages in a way that they can outlast our children. Them kids are going to grow up and they are going to go. And they're going to find them a wife and she don't even want you in her house. So put the babies down. Get a babysitter and put your marriage back as your number one priority. A babysitter is cheaper than a divorce lawyer. And we know the story and I watched how Esther used what she knew. And she used what she had to outsmart the king. As I stated before, Esther was a woman, and women in Persian society were considered inferior and less intelligent than their male counterparts. But watch how God, how Esther used what she had to outsmart the king and Haman and save her people. Because God used Esther for such a time as this. Esther was not trained in war. She didn't know the three different levels of war, tactical, strategic, and operational. She didn't have those special set of skills that Liam Neeson had. She wasn't a negotiator like Samuel L. Jackson. 
She was like Julia Roberts, just a pretty woman. Ain't nothing wrong with being pretty. Esther used her femininity to outmuscle the male game. I got to park this right here. Are we being streamed? I'll behave. And I know the world wants us to believe that we are all the same and we serve a gender neutral God. But my Bible tells me that God created male and female. And he made them in his image. And while I do believe that there are some aspects of gender that may be social constructs, men and women are not the same. I know that I've got three boys. I don't know what's wrong with them. All they want to do is jump and run and destroy and dirty everything. I've been trying to get them to sit down and color for five years. Don't nobody want to sit down nowhere. But I didn't know that. I did not know that. And now they've gotten older. All they want to do is eat. <laughs> Men and women are not the same. God is a God of order. <laughs> Esther didn't try to play the male game. You know, sometimes we women, we try to play the game with a man on his playing field. Uh-uh, you ain't got to do that. The Bible gives men instructions to be cautious about two things. Two things. Liquor and women. Liquor and women. And the reason is because of the power of influence. My granddaddy was a very uh, spiritual man. And when my granddaddy got intoxicated with the spirits, you can get anything from him. Anything from when my, when my granddaddy got drunk. Anything from him. Same thing with men, women. You got to know your man. Listen to me. You got to know the power of influence. You have to know how to build your man up, not break him down. I see a lot of our women get married and talk about the man raggedy. He was raggedy before you married him. And you better make that man believe he is the king so he can go out there and make that money and bring it home to you. We got to watch how we speak to our men. How you think I got my air fryer? <laughs> my husband would come out, he mowed the lawn. He was like, baby, look how I mow. I don't care about no lawn. I'm from Brooklyn, we just got concrete. I don't care about no lawn. I'm like, oh baby, that lawn look nice. But it puts him in a good mood and it makes him want to work hard for me and the boys that's eating everything in my house. Lift our men up. Build them up. We got to change our attitudes. Ladies, sometimes just lower your tone. I know sometimes they act like they ain't got no sense. I know they do. Watch your tone. Lower your tone. And I had to learn. You don't always have to have the last word. Listen to me, man. Let my husband come home and, and, and I'm mad at him and I, I, you know, and I'm getting ready to go in. And I just take a deep breath. And I change my tone. I can say the same thing in a different tone. And that changes his mood and his attitude. Be the queen of your house. You got to know how to deal with your man. You fighting with him in the house and the world fighting with him. Why you think he don't want to come home? He want to stay in the bar. The bartender likes him. 
them people at the bar are nice to him. He know he's sorry, but the bartender like him and his sorry money. Build up your man. Esther knew what she had. Use your feminine powers to build up your man. Listen, Esther ain't go get no, Esther just, Esther went and got her a, a dress, an outfit, and told the king and Haman, come eat. Man, listen, I cooked my husband a nice meal. What you want, baby? And I, got, I done got me a list. <laughs> Use what you have. Esther realized her purpose. She was exactly where she was supposed to be, when she was supposed to be there. She didn't say, well, I don't know anything about politics. She used what she had for such a time as this. What's your purpose? Esther thought that her purpose was to be the queen. No, God put you right there so you can save your people. Some of us are sitting here wondering what our purpose is, and we hear constantly the negativity of our society. And I know I hear some, some, some accents. You know, sometimes we, people make us feel bad because of the way that we speak. Because automatically we, we assume by somebody's accent that they are unintelligent. But the crazy part is we all have an accent. Mine is just different than yours. And we automatically assume when we hear an accent that's different from ours, we think that it's a, a, attributed to intelligence. When in a, all actuality, most people with a different accent speak a couple of languages. And they are just trying to figure out which language they're going to cuss you out in. We need to stop judging people based on how they look and how they sound. We look at people and, 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 and a lot of times it, it, it makes us depressed because we don't have, have them degrees and them high jobs. You know, we, we, we look at people and we ask people, well, what do you do for a living? It's not because they really want to know what they do. We want to know if they are worthy of the respect. Because, you know, we, we tend to think that depending on what your vocation is, it's tied to the respect that I can give you. Right? So we look at people, what school did you graduate from? Let me tell you a secret. The more degrees you have, the more debt you have. And a whole lot of us got a whole bunch of degrees. And we broke as a joke. And you, them people want their money back. We got to stop judging people on these superficial things. Talk about do you have a, a master's of divinity? I don't need a master's of divinity. I want to be mastered by divinity. Stop judging people. On what the world says is acceptable. And start looking at yourself what God said through the prophet Jeremiah. For I know the plans that I have for you. He said plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Some of us believe that we don't have what it takes to get the job done. And we see here with Esther. Esther used what she already have. Everything that you need, you already have. We allow the thoughts of the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, the devil to convince us, especially women, that we are not good enough. We are inadequate. I see a lot of women, they got... Uh, I see my young girls, and I, I talk, you know, a lot of your children and stuff, you know, I deal with them in, in, in youth ministries, and, and they wear the craziest things. Baby, why your eyelashes is over here? I had a friend of mine come to the house, and her eyelashes was crazy. So I said to, I told her to go and come in the living room 
and just blink three times so she can sweep the underside of my fan because I couldn't reach it with the broom. Because we look at what society says is beautiful. They're injecting all kinds of things in there behind. You go into somebody that ain't a doctor to go do some medical procedures for you. That's crazy. Stop comparing yourself to other people. The devil has tried to convince us that we are not good enough, that we are not adequate. But Christ has always tried to prove to us that we are good enough. You are not an accident. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Christ has always tried to get us to realize even though we may not be good enough, we don't need to be good enough. He is good enough. He is adequate. It is not our merits that count, but it's his. Because the Bible tells us that our very righteousness is like filthy rags. So many of us have bought into the lie that there is something that we can do to make God love us less. Or there's something that we can do to make God love us more. We do that church for. We like to think that because I go to church or because I, I do this and I do that, that God is going to love me more than the unbeliever. But the reality is there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. Because there's nothing that you did to make him love you in the first place. Isaiah reminds us of the lengths that the Savior went to redeem us. Isaiah said that he, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and, and it was by his stripes that we are healed. Esther realized that her purpose was for such a time as this. Many of us are in places where we think we don't belong. Many of us believe that because I didn't graduate from this place and I don't have the certification that I am not qualified. And I'm here to tell you that God qualified you from when you were born. He said before you were formed, I knew you. He said not only did I know you, I picked you and I sanctified you. So wherever you are is where I need you to be. We look at people and, and, and we think, or we look at, think of ourselves and I don't know how to do this and I don't know how to do that. If God brought you to it, he will bring you through it. Stop thinking less of yourself. God is going to use you where you are for such a time as this. I remember when I, I served aboard the... Harry S. Truman, I worked on a, on a, on a uh, flight deck. At the Duke room, I was on a flight deck. Little black girl from Brooklyn. And I used to fix airplanes. Million dollar aircraft. And I remember one time, I was up on a flight deck and the plane was ready to go. You have to understand, during our flight, uh, the, the flight um, um, schedule, flights are ready to go at a certain time. Everything that the military does is based on time. And if we miss the time, some, and money. That's a lot of money. So I remember going aboard the aircraft and, and I, I, I fixed everything and, and I, I closed the pilots, I saluted them and I was getting ready to launch it off. But see, when you get off the, when you get on the flight deck, you have to have, we have a tool pouch. And so you have to get your tool pouch checked because you have to make sure that all the tools are there. There can be no missing tools because if there's a missing tool, you have to bring the jets back because if the tools are missing, it could be in a jet and that is a life-threatening activity. So check the tool pouches. My tool, my tool pouch was good. And you have to get another set of eyes because your eyes can let you see what you want it to see. 
And so check my tool pouch and my tool pouch was good and my chief was like good to go and there were other maintainers there and then we checked the tool pouches and, and mind you the F-14s are launching and we're getting ready to launch the, the uh, EA-6Bs and, and we realized that there was a tool missing. And the tool was missing, and we're hearing the air, air boss saying, Zappa Bay, Zappa Line, we're getting, we're waiting for you. The F-14s and the F-18s are waiting for you. You need to get in the flight pattern, pattern so we can take this thing and launch it off. But, but we can't go because there's a tool missing. And so all the main, the, all of the, 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 um, that the uh, maintainers was coming up. And they were trying to figure out how we are going to get this tool. How are we going to find it? And then we realized that the tool was inside of the floorboards. You can't keep the tools in flight of the floorboards because they will get in there and they will obstruct the flight controls. And you will no longer be able to control the plane and it will crash. And so all... Oh, all, all the mechanics came up and they're, all the great minds are trying to figure out how we're going to get this tool out of the floorboards. And here are some of the advice. Maybe we can take off the floor panels. We don't have time. The air boss is calling for the plane. We got to figure this thing out and figure it out now. How to move my little black self to the corner because I don't want them to blame me. And you had all these men that came up that had been in longer than me. They were more knowledgeable than me. They were stronger than me. They were bigger than me. And I moved to the corner away. I was just a little black girl from Brooklyn. And I didn't want to be in the way because I felt intimidated because they knew more than me. And they were more knowledgeable than me. They were more experienced than me. And they were bigger than me. I was just a little black girl from Brooklyn weighing 125 pounds. And they got in there and they were trying to figure out how. And, and the air boss is calling for the plane. Zappa Bay, Zappa Line. We need to launch this thing. And they looked over at me, just a little black girl from Brooklyn. And they were bigger than me. And they were more knowledgeable than me. And, and they were bigger than me. And they were bigger than me. And they realized that because they were bigger than me, I was able to put my little black skinny wrist in the floorboards and receive the screwdriver because God had me for such a time as this. Man, I slipped my little cocoa butter wrist right between the floorboards and retrieved the screwdriver. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was walking around the boat like I was a chief of staff. God can use you for such a time as this. Stop thinking that you are inadequate. Stop thinking that you're not enough. You are enough because he created you enough. One thing that is unique about the book of Esther, keep playing, is that the name of God is not mentioned at all. It was almost not included in the canon for this very reason. But if you ever read the book of Esther, you would realize that God is all up in it. Even though God is silent, his divine providence is loud and clear. And if you read... Chapter 4 and verse 15 in the dialogue between Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai tells Esther, if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from somewhere else. You see, even though God is silent Mordecai reminds Esther that they serve a God that keepeth Israel, a God that neither slumbers nor sleep. Mordecai is reminding Esther that the Jews have a history of serving a God that may not come when you want him, but he's always 
on time, Mordecai is re reminding Esther that they serve a God that delivered them from Pharaoh, a God that rained manna to feed his people, a God that made a faucet from a rock, a God who prepares a table for his people in the presence of their enemies, a God who says, a, a thousand shall fall at thy side and, and 10,000 at thy right hand, and it's not going to come near you. Mordecai reminds Esther that they serve a God of refuge, a God of strength, a God who is a very present help in time of trouble. He reminds Esther that the God of Israel is mighty to save. We ought to be like Esther. When the decrees and declarations of life silence the voice of God in our lives, we got to stand on God's promises. We have to remember how many times he has brought us through for such a time as this. And I imagine Esther and Mordecai praying and fasting. And I, I imagine them praying and fasting. And I imagine them singing, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast but not just steadfast but steadfast and sure while the billows roll and he said that, that, that this rock is fastened to a rock with which cannot move and it's grounded firm it's grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love we have to learn to trust God even when we believe that God is silent. Even when we believe that God is not speaking. We got to learn to trust God. Even when we can't trace God. Job for a while wasn't hearing God. And Job was mad. Job was like, I looked to the right of me and I couldn't feel him. I know some of you guys are praying and you're not feeling God. And Job said, I looked to the left of me and he wasn't there. He said, I looked to the front of me and to the back of me. And then Job finally says, I may not know where God is, but God knows where I am. And Job says in 23, 9 and 10, he says he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me. I shall come forth as gold. Some of you guys are contemplating your lives right now. And you don't seem to be hearing God's voice in your life. And I'm here to tell you that God has you for such a time as this. He's already given you everything that you need. You just got to trust him. And I'm about to close, I'm about to close, I'm about to close. The story of Esther is a story of hope, redemption, faith, courage, God's grace, and God's mercy. God not being mentioned is also indicative of what happens when humankind are left to their own devices. And I know y'all, what, what, what you talking about, preacher? You see, after the Babylonian, Babylonian exile, the Jews had an opportunity to go back home on several occasions. The priest Ezra was granted permission to go back to Israel to build the temple. Nehemiah was also given permission to restore the wall. You see, the Jews had the opportunity to leave. So the question is, what are you doing in Persia? The Jews had no business in Persia. They chose to stay even after they were given permission to leave. They were now acting outside of God's will. And some of us are like the Jews, and you look at your life and what's going on, and God is saying, what are you doing in Persia? I done told you to leave that man after he knocked you upside your head the tenth time. Why are 
you still in Persia? I done told you to leave that job after I gave you another job. What are you doing in Persia? But even though we may be acting outside of God's will, God is still in the saving business. His ears are not heavy that they cannot hear, and his arms are not shortened that he can't reach you. Somebody here have made some mistakes in your life. And you may have went left when God told you to go right. You may be in your own Persia after God have given you opportunity after opportunity to leave. And I'm standing here to tell you that God still cares about you and that Jesus still saves. Some of you may be thinking I am who I am because the devil is attacking me. The devil may very well be attacking you. But the devil already knows the end of the story. The devil may be attacking you because you are in a place where God did not intend for you to be. And the devil is digging ditches so he can bury you. And some of you guys are falling in those ditches. You're falling in the holes. But the devil forgot one thing. That our Jesus was once a carpenter. And while the devil is digging ditches, Jesus is building ladders so you can climb up out of. While the devil is trying to put you in a valley, Jesus is building bridges over troubled water. Jesus still saves. Somebody here wants to say, Lord, I'm tired of being outside of your will. I'm tired of not listening to you. I'm tired of going the wrong way so much so that I end up in Persia. And I, I, I'm having decrees and declarations over my life because I'm in places I'm not supposed to be. And I'm asking you, Father, to just give me some faith. To continue to believe that you have me here for such a time as this. Because I believe that Jesus is the only one that can show up past the deadline and still be right on time. Somebody here wants to rededicate their life to God. I've got two appeals. Anybody here who have not made that commitment to join the body of Christ. Somebody here who have not made the commitment to say, Lord, I choose you. And you want to do so by baptism, profession of faith. This is your opportunity to stand. This is your opportunity to come up. We see what's happening in the world. Earth chapters, we're on the last few paragraphs. And you want to be sure that your name is written there. This is an opportunity for you to say, Lord, I want to choose you all the way into baptism. I'm not going to be long. I smell that rice. I smell it. Second appeal is for those who are tired. You're tired of being outside of God's will. You're tired of trying to do things on your own. You're tired of feeling as if God doesn't see you or God doesn't hear you. You're tired. And you say, Lord, I help my unbelief. I want you to come up here so we can pray for you, so God can strengthen you to continue to trust him even when you can't trace him. For those of you who want to say, Lord, I'm tired, but I need some faith. I need help, Jesus. I need you to come so we can pray for you. I need you to come so that God can continue to rain blessings on you so that you can just keep on fighting. I believe in the power of prayer. I am a product of prayer. Pray that we continue to do God's will and be in God's will even when we don't feel 
that he hears us. Right near it, we need to be up under his arms. to be dipped in that healing stream and it flows from Calvary's mountain flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross your hope is in the cross Father, so many of us are standing here, Father, because we are clinging to the cross. Father, we are clinging to the cross of Calvary because that's the only place that we can find rest and we can find hope and we can find peace, Jesus. Father, so many of us have tried so many things. We, we can't sleep at night, Lord. We're troubled on every side and we are asking you, oh dear God, that, that you just hold on to us, oh dear God. Many of us have let go of you, but we are praying that you hold on to us, Jesus. Father, we believe that in the cross, there is hope. In the cross, there is peace. In the cross, there is more faith, oh dear God. Come see about your people. You know what their needs are. And we're asking you, oh dear God, to pour out a blessing according to your riches and glory. Father, help us to continue to trust you. Even when we can't see you. Father, help us to trust you even when we don't see how you're moving in our lives. Help us to believe, oh dear Father. That you are working it out for our good. And soon and very soon. Our souls will find rest. Beyond the river. Forgive our sins. Cleanse our unrighteousness. In Jesus name. Let the redeemed of God. Say so. Amen. And amen. Be my glory Remain standing for the closing hymn. 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at Thank you, Paul. Amen. We just want to praise God. Are you blessed? Amen. I am blessed. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. We greatly appreciate your ministry. And all right. Edda Dukram says she's coming back again. Amen. Amen. And definitely would like to have her back. Uh, just a couple of items to mention to Ross. Um, lunch will be served. We're having special lunch for all our beautiful ladies in the house. So please don't go away. Stay around for the lunch. And also, Pastor Lee said I should tell you, he's trying to be back here this afternoon, between 2 and 4, to join us for lunch as well. So please hang around for him. We want to wish him a good tidying as he leaves for the military and also for his birthday as well. So let us all be here to celebrate with him. And also next Sabbath is going to be a religious liberty Sabbath. So please, let's pray about it and invite a friend to be here, you know, to bless and uh, serve in this worship of God. So at this time, let us have the benediction. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the privilege of this Sabbath. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that we've received. We thank you because we know that we are here not just by chance, but we are here for a purpose. A purpose in the Lord 
and a purpose in terms of the destiny of this world. And Father, so we pray you, by your grace, help us to be able to live our lives in such a way that shall give glory to your holy name. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ministry of your daughter. We thank you for our pastor here, Pastor Madrid. We thank you for the blessing that she has brought to us. Father, please continue to uplift her, continue to bless her ministry, continue to raise her up to higher heights. Father, we praise your holy name. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for being with us. And Father, please bless the launch that we have prepared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey!